Hello, this is the Ancient History video for Thursday, October 15th, 2020. And we've just seen uh, the second segment from Walking with Prehistoric, or Walking with Monsters, Life Before Dinosaurs, which dealt with the Carboniferous period. Now, make sure you have your note packs out to the uh, timeline where we are uh, dealing with the Paleozoic era. So that is the era of old life. That's number 42. Okay. The Carboniferous is named such for what reason? Well, because that's where much of our coal and oil come from. Uh, coal and oil are fossil fuels. And what that means is that they come from what used to be living things that have since transformed into minerals under the pressure of being uh, buried deep in the earth and under the uh, stresses of time. And remember, if you are cold because of the fan, you can add them to other places. So, as the earth matures and as life moves out onto the land, what we're seeing are wide differences in climate. We've already talked about the fact that on two occasions, the atmosphere literally froze, solid. Now in the Devonian and Carboniferous, what you have are a proportion of atmospheric gases that's very different from the one we have. Now, during the Silurian, there was practically no oxygen. The, the environment was, uh, the air was absolutely poisonous or would have been absolutely poisonous to us. And there was no protection from the UV rays uh, coming from the sun. The ozone layer hadn't formed yet. So basically going out onto the land was like exposing yourself to uh, radiation from a nuclear power plant or a distant atom bomb. But things begin to change. But in the first iteration of an oxygen-rich atmosphere, we have an atmosphere that is, in that period of time, uh, 40, 50, 60 percent oxygen. What we now have is an oxygen-nitrogen atmosphere where nitrogen and other inert elements dominate. I think the air has uh, about, what, 20 percent oxygen, if that? Um. It's a mix between, uh, it's about 70, 76% uh, nitrogen, about um, somewhere, bet somewhere between, uh, somewhere between 24 and 20% 20 uh, oxygen. And, and never trace partial, oxygen. and then partial carbon dioxide. Yeah. Excellent. Excellent. So what is the benefit that we get from breathing less oxygenated air? oxygenated air with a lower percentage. Well, first of all, we don't deal with dragonflies that have wingspans larger than my arms outspread. They had dragonflies that were that big. Um, they also had dog-sized uh, spiders, which is what we saw. And this is because insects breathe through their, their skin, basically. Uh, so air that rich allows for super gigantism. Uh, in insects, arachnids, uh, which causes the world to be very different. But also, what happened during the lightning storm? Was it the direct lightning strike that killed the spider? Um, it, no, it, because the air was so oxygenated, it caused kind of it caused a reaction that basically obliterated everything around it. Yeah, basically, imagine see in Dungeons and Dragons. <laughs> The two most powerful spells a young wizard can get are fireball and lightning bolt. You have to choose between them. And a fireball is like a grenade. You go, and a lightning bolt is, you know, you, you can picture it. But with air that's that oxygen rich, the air itself combusts. So lightning strikes, and the air around the lightning strike burns. It catches on fire. Now, lest you think that that's uh, something that, is so fanciful it's hard to believe. I'm going to give you two examples of fears and realities of air turning on fire. In 1945, when the Manhattan Project was ready to test the first atom bomb at Alamogordo, New Mexico, they did so. But there was a theoretical possibility, and not a little one, 
there was a, th a real theoretical possibility that the atom, atom bomb would burn so hot that it would literally ignite the oxygen in the open atmosphere and burn the atmosphere off the surface of the planet. They gambled that it wouldn't happen because it seemed less than likely, but it was still a real possibility. And had they been wrong, well, we wouldn't be here to worry about it because the Earth would be a burned out cinder without much of an atmosphere. Here's another story. In 1967, our space program had gone through two phases, Mercury program to put Americans in space and the Gemini program to teach Americans how to maneuver in rendezvous in space in preparation for the Apollo program, which would be the plan to get Americans in moon orbit and onto the surface of the moon and bring them back safely to the Earth. Apollo 1 was going to be crew captained by the second American in space, Virgil I. Gus Grissom. Roger Chafee and Ed White were also on board. Ed White was the first American to walk in space, to take a spacesuit and go outside the spaceship and do a spacewalk. Chaffee was a younger guy. In Cape Kennedy, in early 1967, they were doing a test. And the test involved the spacecraft being locked up, and they were basically acting as if they were in space, and they were trying to work out bugs, because the most complex equipment that human beings have ever designed are the Saturn V rocket and the various craft that we sent to the moon, the Apollo capsule. So they're doing this test, and it is uh, absolutely authentic. So what they do is they fill the capsule with the kind of atmosphere that you have in space. In space, right now, the International Space Station, uh, they're breathing a mostly oxygen blend of gases because um, it's easier to uh, on the astronauts to have an, a very oxygen-rich environment. But the air pressure is relatively low because they're in space. In order to empty the gas out of the Apollo 1 spacecraft and have the oxygen-rich blend that they have in space, the air pressure needed to be incredibly high. And then there was a spark. One of the electrical wires had a uh, weak spot in its plastic installation, insulation, and there was a spark, and the air caught fire, and within three minutes, all three astronauts were burned to death. It's the worst space disaster in American history up to the 1986 Challenger disaster and the 2000-whatever um, uh, Columbia disaster. It is one of the big three of deadly American accidents, and it happened on the surface of the Earth because of an oxygen-rich environment. So eventually, after the Carboniferous, uh, the oxygen content uh, is lower. But all of this is evidence of something. Whatever you may personally believe of the scientists who argue that man-made climate change is real and that we can fix it by global regulation, the Earth's climate and the Earth's atmosphere and everything about our natural environment has changed so many times uh, over time out of all recognition. And to argue that there is a normal default setting for our environment that we need to keep to or things are going to go kablooey is flying in the face of natural history. What you want to do with that is up to you. That natural history shows a massive amount of climate, atmospheric, meteorological, continental changes, that's undeniable. So, Paleozithic, Paleolithic is the epoch uh, of um, insects and arthropods, uh, fish and amphibians. But the continents move across the surface of the Earth, like amoebas move, move across a, a pool of water. And towards the end of the Permian period of the Paleozoic era, all of the continents of the Earth are coming together into one massive landmass known as Pangaea. It's not the first time, 
Uh, early in the Paleolithic, there was one super continent called Rodina, and Rodina is Russian for motherland, for homeland. Well, now we're going to have Pangea, and everything comes together. Now, this may have caused what's about to happen, or a bunch of volcanic eruptions may have caused what's about to happen, or a space war between two star-faring alien species might have caused what is about to happen. We don't know why it happened. But the Permian event happens. And the Permian event is the worst mass extinction in the history of the Earth. It kills over 95% of the species on the planet. That's not 95% of the life forms. It's 95% of the species. And most of the species are in the oceans. So the Permian event is strongest felt in the oceans. Now... Extinction is when a single species is wiped out uh, to the point where there's no, not enough breeding stock for it to continue. It basically dies off. Mass extinction is when an event or a series of events wipe out the majority of species on Earth. The worst happens when the continents come together as Pangaea, the Permian event, and most life forms that survive are smaller than a dime. So life has to build itself back. We are now in the Mesozoic era, the age of middle life. And the Mesozoic is divided into three periods, the Triassic, the Jurassic, and the Cretaceous. The Triassic is the rise of the reptiles. And you've got reptiles like the sail-backed Dimetrodon. Uh, Warm-blooded reptiles. Reptiles that are going to become dinosaurs. That are going to become birds. That are going to become animals. The Triassic tends to be dry. And near the end of the Triassic, Pangaea breaks up into Laurasia, a northern continent, and Gondwana land, a southern continent. In the Jurassic, these two continents tend to be hot and humid and wet. And in the Jurassic, we have the great Brontosaurus. And, oh, no, they decided Brontosaurus didn't exist. We have the almost as great Epatosaurus. And we've got Diplodocus which is basically a cow's body with a snake-like head and a snake-like tail and elephant legs all fused together. The Diplodocus and the Brachiosaurus are the largest land creatures ever to exist. They make elephants seem puny by comparison. And what they do, the Diplodocus and the Brachiosaurus, Brachiosaurus are taller and uh, less long than Diplodocus, is uh, they eat and eat and eat and eat because they're plant eaters, they're herbivores. But a new group of predators appears during the Jurassic, among them the Allosaurus. And the Allosaurus looks like a more crocodilian Tyrannosaurus rex. He's got that sauropod build, which basically looks like a plucked chicken. He's got a tail that sticks out the back and legs and this really big head with this really big mouth. And he runs around. And uh, the speculation is that the Allosaurus attack the Diplodocai much the way that lions would go after a very large prey animal today. We don't know. Because the thing about dinosaurs, the thing that you really need to understand, is the closest thing to a dinosaur today is not a crocodile or an alligator. No. The closest thing that exists to a dinosaur today is an ostrich or an emu. You've got this body completely filled with muscle, capable of riding, running as fast as an automobile, almost as fast as a cheetah, with a little tiny brain the size of a walnut. In fact, many dinosaurs have a secondary brain in their hip region to run the backside and a lot of the autonomic functions. If you've ever been close to an emu or an ostrich, you'll know what I'm talking about when I say they convey a form of menace. There's a reason why every ostrich and emu cage ever has said, don't put your fingers near the fence. Because without thinking, 
Mmm, tasty human figure. They will use their razor sharp beaks to snap your finger clean off, and it'll be down its throat before you can say Jack Robinson. If you want to know what an Allosaurus or a Tyrannosaurus was like, or any of the other more mobile and aggressive dinosaurs, look at a ostrich or an emu. During the Jurassic, it is also true that we have the first bird-like dinosaur, the Archaeopteryx. Um, the Archaeopteryx, fossil, fo fossils, the fossils of the, the fossils of the Archaeopteryx are feathered. And this is the first feathered bird-like creature we know of. And it's, it looks sort of like a cross between a lizard and a, dino and, a, and a bird. But what we think evolutionarily is it is the stepping point away from the dinosaurs towards modern birds. And uh, birds do, do, do descend from the dinosaurs. We also know that the ocean is filled with... Um, amazingly huge reptilian creatures, uh, like the ichthyosaur. And the ichthyosaur looks like basically a pointy-nosed dolphin with a vertical tail rather than a horizontal tail, so like a shark-tailed dolphin, or like a really, really sharp-nosed shark. But um, unlike the shark or the dolphin, well, unlike the shark, uh, the ichthyosaur needs to breathe oxygen, air. Unlike the dolphin, which has a blowhole, a nose, basically on the back of its neck, uh, the ichthyosaur has to actually bob up and open its mouth in order to bring air into its system. So the ichthyosaur is considerably less efficient. By the way, the way we discovered that the ichthyosaur was a sea uh, creature was pretty interesting. You had a bunch of guys uh, cutting stone in a quarry, and they were breaking for lunch, and they had some wine and cheese and bread. And they spilled the wine. And the wine ended up going around this, this set of bones and forming the dolphin uh, shark-like shape with the dorsal fin, the pectoral fins, and the tail. Uh, and that's how we get the original idea that it was uh, a sea creature and not a land creature. Anyway, the Jurassic passes, the continents get more widely separated, and they become cooler and drier. And now we're into the Cretaceous period, where pterosaurs have become huge. You have the mighty Pteranodon, with a massive wingspan and a big pointy-backed head that helped it to navigate from place to place. Uh, pterodactyls, little lizardy flying reptiles, and uh, some early feathered birds. At sea, you have probably the most dangerous of marine reptiles, the moasaur, which looks like an ocean-going crocodile that's huge, except instead of legs, it has flukes. It has four flukes where the arms and legs would be. And this thing was fast, and it probably operated in groups, although we're not totally sure. Uh, and this thing made an ichthyosaur or a plesiosaur, the most polite of all dinosaurs, uh, or marine reptiles, look like nothing. A plesiosaur looks like a turtle with a really long snake-like neck for a body, a turtle without a shell. They were around in the Jurassic and the Cretaceous. In any event, you get all these massive reptiles, including the king of terrible lizards, Tyrannosaurus rex. Little tiny arms. If you're happy and you know it, clap. Hmm. Because his arms are too short to clap. I don't know why, but Tyrannosaurus Rex characteristically has these little bitty arms because basically he does whatever he needs to do with his mouth. So if a Tyrannosaurus falls on its back, how does it get back up? It doesn't. Or it rolls, and it's, it does it by its legs. It doesn't lift with its arms. Its arms are about as useful as your appendix, which is a vestigial organ left over from a time when we had a different diet. They really weren't very good for much. Um... Think about domestic turkeys, and they're bred to be fat and tasty. Tasty. They've got these little arms, these little tiny wings that would never carry them anywhere. That's, that's similar to a Tyrannosaurus's four legs, I guess. In any event, so there are the Tyrannosaurus rex. In the classic battle, 
Imagine a giant bull-like dinosaur with a stone, or a bone stone, with a bone crest around the back of its head called Triceratops. And he's called Triceratops, probably most of you know what he looks like. He's got these really long two four, uh, horns coming out of his head facing forward, and he's got a, a sort of beak with a third horn on his beak. And he's a plant eater. And then you've got T-Rex, the, the ultimate predator. And in North America, they come face to face. And the classic battle is Tyrannosaurus Rex versus Triceratops. So one day they're fighting. And all of a sudden, the, uh, they both look up because they see this bright object in the sky. And whether they said a dinosaur version of uh-oh or not, SPOOM! A massive asteroidal impact occurs around the tip of the Yucatan Peninsula in southern Mexico. The Gulf of Mexico and the Caribbean Sea are parts of the crater that form as a result of this massive impact. Picture a really big mountain flying through space at space normal speed, which is really, really fast. And it's so big, it's not going to burn up in the atmosphere. No, it's going to kiss Mother Earth really, really, really fast. This asteroid kicks up so much debris into the atmosphere. Well, just to let you know, there are things that kick up debris into the atmosphere to this very day. Whenever there's a major volcanic eruption, global temperatures cool by at least one or two Fahrenheit degrees, and the sunsets become beautiful because there's huge amounts of particulate matter in the atmosphere. But this asteroid kicks up so much rock and earth that it occludes the sun, darkening the earth for decades. No sunlight means that all plants that rely on sunlight either die or go into hibernation, and many of them die. What eats plants? Herbivores. What eats, her eats herbivores? Er herbivores. Carnivores. So the entire food chain is undermined because the basic parts of it are gone. The oceans are affected, the land is affected, and the biggest creature on Earth... Well, actually, we're not fully done yet. Because it's not just the asteroid that kills. The asteroid blights. On the other side of the world, a little bit later, a few centuries later, in India, what are called the Deccan Traps erupt. The Deccan Traps eruptions are massive supervolcanoes that are like ruptures in the side of the earth, like scars in the side of the earth, long and wide, and not too wide, and they just belch up chemicals and minerals into the air, further darkening and cooling the planet. The result is a nuclear winter that makes everything except for the Permian event look like a a, a bad rainstorm. This, this, this nuclear winter, this, this shadow world, has such death that the largest creature on Earth is about the size of a field mouse. Everything else dies. And after that mega death, we now have the Cenozoic life, the era of recent life. And whereas the Paleozoic was the time of arthropods, insects, uh, fish, and amphibians, and the Mesozoic era was the age of reptiles and dinosaurs, the Cenozoic era is the age of birds and mammals. Early in the Cenozoic, in South America, there were birds 15 feet tall that could run as fast as a Buick, 45 or 50 miles an hour. These axe beaks, as they're known, or terror birds, as they're known, are the apex predators in South America. And they basically act like Tyrannovelociraptor eating machines. Um, they can outrun almost anything. Uh, they can outfight almost anything. And it's good that they had, weren't around when people developed, or we would have had to drive them instinct, extinct in order to stay alive. They were massively scary. There were also huge tree sloths that were aggressive, too. You might not imagine a sloth being very dangerous. Well, imagine a sloth the size of an elephant that actually had a temper. 
But as the Cretaceous develops, a climate change occurs. Another one, Laurasia and Gondwana land have long separated. And now we have a world that has much of the continental shapes that we have now. Antarctica has left the tropics and has become the, sub, uh, the, the, the South Pole's continent. Um, India has smushed into Africa, creating the Himalayan mountains. Uh, and Africa and Eurasia are kissing. Now, this is different. See, in the old days, before uh, the mid to late Cretaceous, there was an open sea separating Africa from Eurasia. From the Atlantic through what's now the Mediterranean, through what's now Arabia, into the Indian Ocean. This was called the Tethys Sea. And the Tethys Sea is much bigger than the Mediterranean today. Well, the Tethys Sea was also joined by the fact that North and South America were separate. So there was an equatorial warm water current that went around the world completely. And that equatorial warm water current stabilized global climate and global temperatures. But Africa and Eurasia kiss and then they smush into one another and the modern Middle East is created and the Tethys Seaway is closed. And that disrupts global climate global ocean patterns, warm water currents and such that affect the world's climate. And then North and South America kiss at the Isthmus of Panama. Oh, we like each other so much, smooch. And they come together, completely destroying the warm water conveyor current of the equator. And since then, we have been in a period of profound climate instability. In other words, ice ages. Ice ages. Ice ages occur when global climates plummet and much of the extreme uh, northern and southern hemisphere uh, basically has its climate zones moved by a thousand or more miles. So what is now like Norway, northern Norway, really subarctic and arctic climate can be found during the ice ages in North Africa and in India. Uh, and much of Europe and Central and Northern Asia are literally covered by the polar ice sheet, the polar ice cap, by massive, massive uh, glaciers. This part of the world had over a mile of ice, right here, right now, well, right now, millions of years ago, uh, more than once. In fact, there used to be a great glacial lake in this region, and vestiges of that include Flathead Lake and Lake Ponder, well, maybe Lake Ponder, and Lake Coeur d'Alene. So the glaciers and the ice packs fuse in the north and in the south, and the global climate becomes much cooler and much drier. And these ice ages come and go. Again, we're in, a, we're in an interglacial period. Sooner or later, unless something profound changes about planet Earth, we're going to have another ice age. In fact, when climate scientists first began ringing the alarm bells that something bad was happening to the climate, it was the 1970s. I remember it. And they all talked about there being a new ice age coming because glaciers in Switzerland and elsewhere kept growing every year and they weren't melting back every summer by the same rate. Also, in the 1970s, we had a series of very cold winters. I became disenchanted with these people who, many of them, the very same folks, 20 years later in the 1990s, argued just as vociferously that we were going to go through a phase of greenhouse uh, global warming. Ah, uh, same people, opposite effect. In the 2000s, they decided to hell with it. We're not going to predict anything specific. We'll just call it man-made climate change, which they've done to this day. The world's climate changes, and a series of ice ages begin to occur. We are a product of that. The human species, as we know it, comes out of an interglacial period in the ice ages. Let me explain. Mammals develop. Now, what, I guess we didn't even go over the qualities of the, of the various uh, phyla of life, uh, uh, the various fauna. So let's do that. Let's make sure that we know what we're talking about. We're looking for qualities of insects, reptiles, 
birds, and so forth. So we're on items 50 through 55 in your notes. Creatures who lay eggs have six to eight legs, have exoskeletons, and live on land and water and in the air are called insects. Creatures who lay soft eggs in water breathe water as youngsters and air as adults and have soft and slimy skin are amphibians. By the way, fish meet all of those definitions except they breathe water their entire lives. Now this is interesting. Consider the life of a typical simple frog. You've got gelatinous eggs that look a little bit like Ikaro sushi eggs. Just a little, because they're sort of like fish eggs. And they are laid in along the stalks of um, underwater plants. So you pop out of the egg, and now you're a little tadpole. Basically a torpedo, a living, little tiny miniature living torpedo with a tail that moves around. And you swim around the pond or the pool or the stream or wherever it is you are, eating and growing up big and avoiding uh, predators. Let's say you succeed. Then you go through a midlife crisis. And in that midlife crisis, it's like puberty, only much, much worse. What happens is uh, you change. Instead of being a long, lean tadpole, you become a big, squat, roundish frog. Instead of having a single tail that moves you through the water as you breathe the water, you've got legs, four of them. Two medium-sized legs for the front, and two massively powerful jumping legs for the back. And suddenly, <coughs> you can't breathe <coughs> water anymore. you got to go up into that weird, harsh, cold place, the air, and onto land to survive. What an amazing life that would be. Think about it. We human beings grow and change. You guys are in the midst of that still. You're not going to, you don't look the way you're going to look as adults. You're not fully there yet. And as adults, you'll still change. Maybe some of you will grow wide rather than tall, which is what happened to me. Maybe your hair will change. All sorts of things will happen. But a human being can look back at themselves and say, yep, that's me. That was me as a baby. That was me as five years old. That was me at 12 years old. That was me at 20. Now I'm 40. Look at me now. It's the same basic person, the same basic body type. How would it be? How would it be to go through the phases of an amphibian's life and to be aware of it? That's the difference. They're not really aware of it. They just follow instincts. But do you know what happens in a womb? In a womb, in a womb we go through all the stages of evolution. There are times in the womb where we are like a flatworm or a jellyfish or a fish or an amphibian. We have reptile, reptilian characteristics and primitive mammalian characteristics, and then we become us. It's like a little miniature evolutionary process for all of us as we develop in uh, gestation. Now we come to creatures who lay leathery eggs on land breathe air, have dry and scaly skin, and have cold blood. Those are reptiles, like crocodiles. Creatures who lay leathery eggs on land, breathe air, have dry and scaly, maybe feathery skin, and maybe warm blood, like the Allosaurus. Those are dinosaurs. Dinosaurs and reptiles, not exactly the same thing. Creatures who lay hard eggs on land, breathe air, have feathers, and have warm blood, like eagles are birds. And creatures who give live birth, that's one of the advantages of being a mammal. We don't lay eggs outside of our bodies. We have eggs inside of our bodies, and those eggs uh, gestate. Give live birth whose females lactate, that is, produce milk for the young. Reptiles don't lactate, amphibians don't, human females do. Uh, so do uh, mammoth females and hamster females. Who breathe air, have fur or hair, and have warm blood like cats, those are mammals. Now there is an early phase of mammals that doesn't quite give live birth the way we do. Do any of you know what they are? Now you know, just checking to see if anyone else. Yes? Isn't it the platypus? The platypus and the kangaroo and What's the wall wallaby? Okay, never mind. I was going to say the wallaby. <laughs> yeah. Uh, do any of you know what they're called? They basically have a pouch. 
Marsupials. Marsupials. Thank you so much. I completely forgot the word. And I, it was important. So, marsupials. Muchos gracias. Uh, marsupials are like pseudo mammals. In fact, the platypus is like God has a sense of humor or a creature that is designed by a committee. It has a bird's beak. It lays eggs like a bird. It has hair. It has duck feet. It's just messed up. Um, it doesn't fit into I'm just wondering because I heard the theory that um, at one point in time, uh, there were multiple species of human. However, the Homo sapiens were the only ones that evolved and survived. We're going to get to that next time. Tomorrow, mm -hmm. I think. Uh, so... And yes, in effect, that's true. Either we crossbred with Neanderthals or we wiped them out. Um, and that's, you know, people do the funniest thing. Would you really want another intelligent species around? Think no, about it's kind that. of scary, but, like, but, then again, but then again, there's there's literally gorillas who can do sign language. Yeah, if we teach them. I mean, but if we, if we get anywhere close to the planet of the apes, I'm taking out a gun. Yeah. Uh, because I do not want to be some ape slave. And I've, I've seen how those movies end. I mean, like, I mean, like, Robin Williams, one of his best friends is literally Coco, the gorilla. Yeah, yeah. So, like, I do think that there, if, if that were Oh, look, we're going to talk about other non-human intelligences. I mean, so like, I think, I think there are intelligences on this world other than that. We're going to talk about that. Yeah. I don't know who Jane Goodall is. Oh, she, tell her. So where we're leaving things is the Cenozoic era and the era of uh, birds and mammals. You can talk quietly until dismissal. I have one. There. And to those of you at home, thank you for visiting. We'll see you tomorrow. Same time, same channel. <laughs>